It's Monday. And it's May 9th. And the word of the day is afterclap, which means a negative twist at the last second when it seemed like something was already over. And apparently there's a new usage that means the person who claps for too long and everybody looks at you. <laughs> Used in a sentence, especially in a sexual context, nobody likes the afterclap, regardless of which definition <laughs> you're talking about. Well, but of all the claps you could give someone during sex, it's not the worst. Yeah. Nope. And I've always found the premature clap to be more of a problem, but hey, that's on me. So, you know. <laughs> uh, clap. Sorry. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, New Jersey's weed is as legal as it is expensive. Madison Cawthorn's existence continues to be the free space of political comedy. (laughs) And Twitter just got recalled for running a red light and killing a pedestrian. Weird. (laughs) But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Snow Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, you ready to climb the turnbuckle and hit the news from the top rope? I, t- I feel like these days, if I'm coming off that top rope, there better be a step stool. Sorry. Yeah, I need a yeah, step I'm stool to point. poop at this point. Like- <laughs> <laughs> you do. That's a good title for that product. In our lead story tonight, Elon Musk is buying Twitter. The platform is basically the town square of the internet. And a libertarian sci-fi character, but real, who got his start as a white guy in South Africa with emerald mines, decided he wanted to buy it out of nowhere. So now the town square is going to stop having public ownership, and it's going to get taken over by the richest person in the world. So we can have more freedom. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Heath. I take issue with town square as the metaphor. It's it's like the insane asylum of the Internet that all of us started visiting to see if the president was starting a nuclear war. Oh, OK. Yeah. But like for those of us in the rural south, that's a pretty apt description of our town square, too. So <laughs> it works. Fair. So I feel like it that's works. fair. Every town's got a guy. OK, so the big question is why? Why is Elon Musk spending $44 billion to buy Twitter? Right. And nobody seems to know the answer. Twitter has not recorded a profit for eight out of the last 10 years. And Elon Musk has no experience with running a social media company. Their whole business model at Twitter is based on ad revenue. And Elon Musk doesn't even use traditional advertising with Tesla. It just doesn't make sense. But that hasn't stopped everyone from speculating about his plan. So... Let's do some speculating about his plan. This is the podcast. It's what we do. I'll start with a simple theory. Elon Musk is a sociopath. I like this one. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like that tracks because Elon Musk is a sociopath. Mm -hmm. He definitely seems to believe he's, you know, the one man who can change the landscape of ideas in the world with this one simple trick. And based on everything he's said, that one simple trick is no rules at all. He wants to stop Twitter moderators from banning accounts or removing tweets. Apparently, he thinks if, you know, neo-Nazis and anti-vaxxers could just freely present their very nuanced ideas in 280 characters or less, we'd have a healthy, robust political discourse all of a sudden solved. So theory number one, this wasn't a business move for profit. Musk is spending $44 billion. About half of that is just his money, not investors. And he's doing that as a pet project about free speech. Yeah. Sub theory, the white guy whose dad was an emerald mine owner is racist. In South Africa. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And and he sees an opportunity to hand one of the largest platforms on the planet over to, you know, his people. And by his people, I mean racist. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and not to put a nail in the tire of this whole endeavor, but I feel like the only way you're going to get his true plan is to get captured by him in his fucking lair and strapped into some <laughs> slow laser-based execution device. Yeah, I mean, as long as I don't have to watch his SNL appearance. There's no it. way he doesn't have that. <laughs> so another part of this free speech angle is the Donald Trump question. Trump got banned from Twitter last year, as everybody knows, after the company decided that Letting someone use their enormous platform to spread very dangerous lies was a bad idea. Or is it, says Elon Musk. Yes, yes, it is. That's a bad idea. Stop (laughs) saying or is it like that. That's not a business plan. But Musk seems to be hinting at the idea of maybe reinstating Trump. That being said, Trump claims he probably won't rejoin Twitter, even if he gets (laughs) welcomed back. But 
He's lying. Yeah. He is He's lying. clearly yes. lying. Let's be honest. A $44 billion corporate raider deal, highly improbable, followed by an overhaul of the entire moderation policy at Twitter. All that is way more viable than Trump's startup Truth Social going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So think he's going to be back on. There's a good chance we see Trump back on Twitter for his next campaign if Elon Musk indeed gets his way. Yeah, no, Trump saying he wouldn't rejoin Twitter had a very I wanted to be in my room anyway vibe <laughs> yeah. to it. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. And Musk seems to think he's being just the supremely logical centrist here. Mm -hmm. Last week he tweeted, quote, a social media platform's policies are good if the most extreme 10% on the left and right are equally unhappy. And um, that's fucking stupid. Sure that is. That's it's, dumb. Yeah. That's not how anything works with numbers or anything. That's only true, what he just said, if those two groups are exactly equally dangerous. Right. And that's insane. When the town square has a neo-Nazi with a race war manifesto, also they have a leftist econ nerd with a communist manifesto pamphlet that they're handing out. You don't split the difference because they both have the word manifesto. <laughs> Just Elon standing there with a gun. Oh no, on the one hand, we have the source of all terrorist violence for the last X amount of years. And on the other hand, we have humorless college students. <laughs> Which one do I shoot? They're identical. <laughs> so, so again, regardless of how the moderation policy changes, this doesn't look like a good business plan. And that brings us to a second theory. He's buying Twitter with plans to start selling access to the network to third party companies. And here's how that might work. According to business and technology analyst Ben Thompson, Benny T. Musk, could, <laughs> Musk could split Twitter into two separate companies, with one being the ad based app business and the other being the core Twitter network of content and user data. The app side would continue with business as usual. We'd use Twitter. And the side with the data could basically rent out its giant existing network of content to the app side, but also to any other company that wants to set up its own client experience. So, for example, Trump's Truth Social could basically rent Twitter and avoid starting from scratch and getting a body of users on their own. And they could offer a client experience that doesn't do any moderating of toxic content if that's what they wanted to do. And that is what they want to do. And they'd immediately have all the tweets on existing Twitter as content for users. So that's fun. That's a fun possibility. Musk might be buying a giant information network and weaponizing it and then renting out the weapon to use however you want yep. if you can afford it. Okay. Counterpoint, listeners, you're all invited to Eli's Happy Time Network, which is just thirst traps of me no other content allowed on the platform <laughs> right, i'm pretty sure Subscribed. you're just pitching your only fans again noah elon's making his business proposals i'm making mine <laughs> <laughs> so all that being said i'm guessing it's kind of both theory one and theory two together musk has a plan for monetizing twitter at least in his head but even if that doesn't work very well he gets to do his pet project of being a sociopath who thinks he's going to fix the world with free speech that's extra free or whatever he thinks is going to happen. And of course, he can keep lying about Tesla going private on Twitter because he owns it now and, you know, paying a small fine to the SEC when he does that and watching Tesla stock go up huge based on the belief that he'll eventually be the biggest car company in the world because he's a delicate genius. Well, here's what I'm hoping for. And OK, I don't usually say this. Bear with me. I think there's some great wisdom in the book Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Have you been kidnapped and replaced I, I, by I, just Stay with me. I will okay. get there. Okay. So, uh, Elon, I know you're listening. Please read that book. And then please gather up all your billionaire friends and disappear into a magical invisible valley. <laughs> of humans. That would totally teach us all a lesson about the value of unfettered capitalism and free speech and bootstraps. Made of blood emeralds. That's an important lesson. You'd totally get us. Exactly. And hey, if that doesn't work, I know a free speech platform that's about to be very open to me tweeting that picture of Elon Musk and Jelaine Maxwell together at that party. <laughs> so. Yikes. All right. On that note, segue, guys. I'm going to just leave some space for our advertiser that's coming up. Space, space, space. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. I just feel like we're creating a society where self-expression is stuck in this approval loop, you know? 
you like you you have to wear pants at Wendy's. That has nothing to do with expression. Does it? Guys, guys. Hey, Keith, what's up? Yeah, so did you do the BetterHelp ad yet? Uh, No, we were just about to. Okay, well, don't bother, because I have a way better service to plug. Oh, yeah? What's that? Cheddar help. Cheddar help? Yes, cheddar help, correct. Okay, well, better help is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Okay, that, that's pretty good. Cheddar help is whenever you have a negative thought or emotion, you eat cheddar cheese. Okay. Um, well, well, BetterHelp is affordable and financial aid is available. Cheddar help is, okay, admittedly, noticeably more expensive. Cheese can be pricey, but still, well, it's great. Skeptocrat listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash Skeptocrat. Uh, I'm open to negotiation for bulk discounts as well. Are you? Okay, well, if you're experiencing stress and you think that talking to somebody might help, give BetterHelp a try. And if beating your heart is too easy, come on over to Cheddar Help. Sorry, sorry. if beating your heart is too easy? No, I get it. Eli gets it. (laughs) (laughs) And we're back. Next up in headlines in What's a Marijuana with You News. What, be... Because they both start with M? I, I, an and M. I said it in a voice. Nailed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. My beautiful home state of New Jersey officially began recreational marijuana sales last Woo-woo. week. And it is glorious. So my friends, pull up a plate of gabagool and realize just how quickly No Illusions is running out of excuses not to move to the same neighborhood as my baby as I give you the rundown. Okay, so, like, tempting me away from a sultry, putrid swamp in the bowels of Trump country shouldn't take a lot of effort, right? And yet, it has. I got a different putrid swamp for you, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) This is an industrial swamp. So, let's talk numbers. On the first day alone, 12,438 customers, including yours truly, bought nearly $2 million of legal slamma jamma. Which, at the state's tax what? rate of 6.625%, is $132,500 in taxes. Much of which has been earmarked for communities negatively affected by the war on drugs. And, you know, that, that actually kind of seems like a good thing. You think? That being said, this also puts a bunch of young, plucky entrepreneurs at college out of a job <laughs> right away. But yeah, whatever <laughs> bullshit ethical thing Eli said. Blah, blah, blah. So, I'm sorry, I gotta dial it back a second. Slamma Jamma? Thank you. Eli, yes. Are you getting what? your nicknames for weed from a 1990s dare pamphlet now? <laughs> that, that lady looked at me weird when I did request Slamma Jamma. So <laughs> that does explain it. I don't like the taste. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but wait, Eli. Did medical marijuana patients run out of supply as many doomsayers predicted? No, they didn't. Because the dispensaries had a fuck ton of weed. And of New Jersey's 23 medical dispensaries, only 12 started selling recreationally. But again, no, there was absolutely no shortage of supply and medical patients still have access to services recreational customers don't. Like online ordering and special medical only hours at stores and a full menu, which includes products that recreational menus don't. Not to mention with many dispensaries adding, not quote, you fucking legalized this a year ago. We had time to get ready, you committee of blue haired assholes. And not quote. Also, most of those medical patients had like chronic sobritis, owie, generalized right. pain yes. of the body, whatever. <laughs> Just fucking sign the script, man. They're fine. Right. They're going to be fine. To be Almost clear, all of them. Medical marijuana is just the bullshit thing we fought for. Where we didn't think we could get recreational. Yeah. Right. If medical marijuana patients couldn't get weed, they might have to opt for medicine instead. That's not exactly a tragedy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And every time you point that out, someone's like, well, my cancer of the bl-. and I'm like, and we're not obviously we're not talking about you. We're talking about me. OK, we're talking no, about, I'm what talking I'm, about you, too. Yeah. If you go, it's not effective at anything medical. We're talking about whatever the medical experts say is real. Not yeah. that. Well, either way. Weed is here to stay. The guys are running out of excuses not to have buddy houses here in New Jersey. And before Noah can argue, his internet will probably go out again. Well, that's okay. (laughs) All right, that's true. (laughs) And in Wall Be Damned news, in our rush to laugh at how terrible Donald Trump failed at getting his stupid wall built, it's easy to overlook the fact 
that to the extent that he did succeed, he just succeeded in getting people killed or grievously injured. So that's the finding of a report published last week in the Journal of the American Medical Association in what was the first attempt to quantify injuries resulting from the little bit of wall he did manage to get built or augmented. Uh, specifically, they looked at a raised barrier along California's border and found it resulted in a five-fold increase in major injuries as well as an infinity-fold increase in deaths. What it did not find, however, was any significant decrease in border crossings. Yeah, just lots of people being like, oh, look, the it's a very small piece of wall here. Uh, what we go around, right? It, it, <laughs> en it ends right there. I can see with my eyes. It ends right there. We'll just go one around. guy apparently this year was like, "I'm gonna jump." Ow, I died. Yeah, I died. no, it's Ow. it's more than one guy. So to be clear, the only effective thing Trump ever did to curb undocumented immigration was his mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic. Right, like by the midway point of his term, America had become such an undesirable place to be that a lot of potential immigrants decided that whatever gang violence or lack of opportunity they were fleeing from wasn't as bad as Trump's leadership. The feeble extent to which his administration was able to erect physical barriers, if anything, actually served as an invitation to potential migrants. Right, like seeing how inept his folks were in terms of building a fucking wall or putting up a fucking fence, no doubt boosted a lot of people's confidence that they'd be pretty easy to outwit. <laughs> That's reasonable. Now, during his re-election campaign, Trump claimed that his administration had built just over 400 miles of border wall, which is a pretty feeble boast when you consider that's barely a fifth of what they promised. <laughs> uh, so, as is so often the case in stories about the Trump administration, even if it was true, it would be pathetic, and it wasn't true. It wasn't even <laughs> true, though. <laughs> in reality, they built something like 80 miles of new barriers, and even that number is deceptively high, given that many of those new barriers were built behind existing barriers. <laughs> Um, in truth, only about 47 miles worth of previously unobstructed border was walled off. And that's before you factor miles? in the amount that fell down the first time it rained real hard. Uh, the other 300 plus miles he bragged about was actually just reinforcements and repairs to existing barriers, many of which were just scheduled maintenance type of shit. <laughs> Okay, what if we report the length of the slats instead of the width? I feel like we're telling ourselves short. Let's tell them about the length. We, you measure from the taint. That's the rule. Yeah, they have to right. measure you from my them taint. all up, end to end. Um, Tyler, get in here. But, but one of the few places where significant augmentations actually were made was the barrier just south of San Diego, where the height of the existing structure was raised from between 9 and 17 feet to a uniform <laughs> 30 feet, or just over 9 meters for our listeners with sensible units of measure. Okay. I was joking about the link. No, thing, yeah, but <laughs> they tried to kind of do that. Yeah. So, but Trump claimed that these sections of wall, quote, can't be climbed, end quote, which it turns out to be about as true as every other fucking thing. He said, look, look if you can lean a ladder against something, you can fucking climb it. That which, is, yep. Yep. That's and that's works. exactly what migrants have been doing. The real difference between a 17 and 30 foot wall isn't in its scalability, but in its likelihood of serious injury if you fall. I mean, you know, don't take falling advice from a podcast and all, but most healthy people can walk away from a fall of 9 to 17 feet with only minor injuries. At 30 feet, not so much. Oh, okay, check your healthy person privilege. I broke my leg jumping like six feet off a very small shed. That's true. So I once broke Heath's leg for jumping off my shed. So I, <laughs> I said, I said most. <laughs> um, now, of course, the most fucked up aspect of this story is that the demonic xenophobes that support Trump are probably thrilled about this news. Right, The increased risk of injury is a feature, not a bug. In fact, before adding this, they knew that it would lead to more injuries and they knew it wouldn't lead to fewer immigrants. As was so often the case in the Trump administration, the cruelty was the point all along. But even from a perspective of sociopathic self-interest, this is a fucking disaster. Like at Scripps Mercy Hospital in San Diego, injuries from falling off the border wall accounted for 16% of their trauma patients. That's a higher percentage than gunshots and stabbings combined. And as the Washington Post points out, quote, those injured by falls often require complex intensive care and multiple phased surgeries, end quote. And since they're virtually all uninsured, they're generally ineligible for physical therapy and rehab programs, which leads to longer unreimbursed hospital stays. So to get their sadistic result, they're paying millions of dollars and reducing everyone's access to the ICU. Which, if you think about it, Kind of the Trump legacy in a nutshell. Isn't it, though? Yeah. yeah. You kind of transitioned to the, the COVID policy of the Trump <laughs> yeah. administration there, too. Right. So bottom line, though, the Biden administration didn't do enough when they halted construction on day one. Like every other aspect of Trump's legacy, this needs to be dismantled. 
Mr. Trump, tear down that wall. <laughs> there, you, Yeah. And with all due apologies for making my poor co-host write jokes into a story about head injuries and shit, I'm at least partially going to redeem myself by pointing out that it makes for a great transition to a word from our other sponsor this week, Policy Genius. Hi, I'm No Illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And I'm Eli Bosnick. As you may have noticed, something's irrevocably broken about society right now, and the background hum of the universe is malicious and dark. What? But Policy Genius makes it easy to get insurance quotes from top companies so you can find your lowest price fast on home, life, auto, renters, or even disability insurance. Sometimes I think I'm in, like, a simulation, and it's a test about suffering, or maybe it's hell. Anyway, uh, pushing right past that, Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. Click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com and answer a few questions. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search. The Policy Genius team can look for ways to save you even more money. If you like what they find, they'll get you switched over for free. Policy Genius has saved new customers an average of $350 per year on home insurance. Plus, the Policy Genius team works for you without bias or favor to any one insurance company. Even after you're covered, Policy Genius offers claim support and easy reshopping to find savings when it's time to renew. And everybody's always just like, oh, it's always been that bad. You just didn't notice. But I, I don't I don't think that's true. I, don't, okay. I know it isn't true. Okay. So just head to policygenius.com to get your free home insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Policy Genius. They can't save you from the void, but maybe they can slow your descent. Super what? duper not their catchphrase. I feel like it's everything's catchphrase just now. Just do the comedy podcast, man. Okay. And we're back. Next up in headlines. For the last decade or so, it seems like the United States has been losing the intelligence battle with Russia. For example, they definitely honeypotted Madison Cawthorn into marrying a spy, despite the very beautiful, loving relationship that he apparently has with his buddy Steve. <laughs> also, good chance they have a tape of Donald Trump getting peed on by sex workers at a hotel in <laughs> Moscow. That's great if you like that, but not for him. And somebody's got to be watching that video every day. I feel like it exists. Oh, also one other thing. Um, Russia made him president that one time. Yeah, they did that. do that one. Yeah. But recently, the U.S. has been turning the tide a little bit. I'd like to believe it's a chess game that we actually started winning with some good strategy. But sometimes your adversary has an idiot on the team and they let that idiot be in charge of making a chess move. Well, it looks like that happened this week in Russia. According to Vladimir Putin... His federal security service stopped a Ukrainian terrorist cell that was going to murder a pro-Kremlin TV journalist. But then they released a photo of what they gathered in that raid, and it became very clear that the Russian government staged the whole thing as anti-Ukrainian propaganda. Like, there might as well be a bumper sticker in the raid picture that says, we're Ukrainian Nazis and we're planning a murder that's real for real. <laughs> I don't want to spoil the punchline to your story, Heath, but it is so much dumber than a bumper sticker. It's story. really infinitely <laughs> dumber than that. <laughs> like, we'll get there in a second. Boss, do assassins even draw blueprints? I feel like they wouldn't draw blueprints, <laughs> no? <laughs> so here's what the Russian Federal Security Service claims they found in the raid. There was one IED, which I'm mean, already weird. It seems like you'd have more than one exactly <laughs> IED if you had those. Also, six pistols, a sawed-off shotgun, one grenade, again, weird to have just the one, over a thousand rounds of ammo, one bag of drugs, just drugs, non-specific, <laughs> a stack of fake Ukrainian passports, and eight Molotov cocktails. But in Russia, I think they just call them cocktails. Quick diversion <laughs> for a couple fun facts. First of all, despite what you might have heard from pro-Trump talking head Scotty Nell Hughes, the weapon is not called a... Mazel Tov cocktail. <laughs> Very different weapon, yes. Does, yeah. not, <laughs> does not mean what that means. That means, Mazel Tov means good fortune or congratulations in Yiddish and Hebrew. They didn't name a makeshift firebomb after that phrase in Yiddish and Hebrew. <laughs> the word is Molotov, which actually means hammer in Russian, and it's named after a Russian guy whose last name was Hammer in Russian. The weapon existed for a while without having a moniker attached, but eventually got named after Russian Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov, who signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany in 1939. How'd that work out? 
Yeah, right. So, granted, Russia eventually landed on the good team in that whole thing. Yeah, but it adds good. an extra layer of stupid, considering this whole fake raid was part of a propaganda scheme to claim that Ukraine is full of Nazis. Yeah, you know what well-armed terrorist cells with grenades and IEDs need? Homemade bombs. Homemade bombs, yeah. <laughs> <an> IED is, <laughs> but also... Why not make the number of guns and the amount of ammunition match, right? Like a thousand rounds, I got six <laughs> pistols, in case all six of them have to reload 13 times each during the assassination. <laughs> what the hell is going on? It's a really weird plot they have gone. That blueprint doesn't make sense. So on top of everything I just mentioned, the Russian government also said they seized a collection of what they called nationalist literature and paraphernalia. This includes a plain red T-shirt with a big swastika on the chest. Oh, you know that guy's going to die. And, <laughs> and also a single piece of paper with a printed swastika oh, on it. Christ. Just for fun, I guess. What? They printed that out. No, you, 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 you pin a tiny little mustache on it when you're blindfolded. The whole, <laughs> yeah. the whole party has fun with that. But here's the best part. The photo also showed three copies of the video game The Sims Three. Yes. And, um, yeah. Immediately upon seeing that, the entire internet was like, "Okay, that's that's clearly some idiot at the Kremlin who got told to find three SIM cards, <gasps> like for a phone, and got confused." Oh my god! And he was like, that oh, is. I need three SIMs. Okay. <laughs> that. That or we missed that on the Heil Hitler expansion. I haven't been keeping up with the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> this is so stupid. I love it. Also worth noting, the three copies of the video game were the physical discs in the like DVD style case. And that game came out in 2009. So a Russian spy spent a bunch of time looking for three physical copies of this game from 13 years ago. And then he came back and set up that photo and nobody else involved in the whole operation thought to ask, hey, just really quick, why would a neo-Nazi Ukrainian terrorist have that? <laughs> and even if they made up a good answer, why three copies? Why would it be three? What the fuck were they picturing in the day-to-day -day of a Ukrainian terrorist that they did this? I, don't, I have no idea. Regardless, you gotta love bad guys failing, and it seems to be what happened here. Don't you, though? And in gay nine news, in case you're wondering how homophobia is going for people as far as existing in reality is going, the answer is bad. It's a bad time for homophobes who want to exist in the dimensions of time and space these days. And perhaps there's no better example of this than the story of Fezco, a North Carolina mutt who was dropped off at a shelter this week because he humped another male dog in the dog park and his owners were afraid he was gay. Fuck you. Oh, okay. What? This is a story about the RNC and Madison Cawthorn. I thought we were doing that next. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we're recording this a week out. The odds that he's going to get caught fucking a dog before this goes to air are remarkably high. Yeah, yeah. Like higher for him than anyone else, I think. Even money. Now, as the Huffington Post quite sassily points out, quote, homosexual behavior has been observed in more than 1,500 animal species. The ASPCA says that it's common for dogs to mount and thrust against other animals, people, and objects, including wadded up blankets, dog beds, and toys, as a form of masturbation or as a response to stress, end quote. Not adding, and I'm pretty sure your dog's not a bed sexual, you worthless <laughs> ick. <laughs> like, literally, whatever these people are and whatever they do in their life, they will always be empty and a waste of existence. We should cut them up and feed them to Fezco. <laughs> so, I feel like we could just, like, we could get them to stop drinking water if we teach them about refraction, right? That's just been hiding gay rainbows this whole time, yo! <laughs> Two votes. Uh, but don't worry, this story actually has a happy ending. As soon as this story hit the airwaves, Steve Nichols and his longtime partner john who are gay picked up fezco and gave him a new and much more loving home renaming him oscar after poet and also on purpose homosexual oscar wilde he's currently Ooh. enjoying his new home with his brother harry a morbidly obese terrier chihuahua mix who honestly could use the exercise his new baby brother seems to be giving him so yeah it's all working out for everybody except the homophobes which is great yeah and finally tonight in Cawthorn in their side news, Madison Cawthorn made a bet with an evil genie that he could, too, get himself expelled from Congress, and that <laughs> evil genie is borrowing against it. 
<laughs> right? Like, seriously, he's like a recurring character on a bad sketch comedy show, and he just keeps getting worse. And let's keep in mind, his starting point was sex criminal Hitler superfan. Yep. Right? From there, he has managed to lower my opinion of him several times over. Found a down ramp from yeah, that. Yeah, right. Wow. And with the admission that this statement may very well be dated by the time this episode goes to air, the latest decline came in the form of getting detained at an airport after trying to bring a loaded handgun onto an airplane again. For the second time. Yes. yes. For the second time. Oh, really? I can't take this through security. You're saying I can't take... Fine, fine. I'm eating the bullets. You have to let me <laughs> eat the bullets first. <laughs> right here you in can't line. steal my bullets. You let that stealing. lady drink her water. I get to eat my bullets. I, you know what? I'm saying it's a part of my chair. You don't know. It could be. It could be a part of my chair. I'm eating the gunpowder. <laughs> now... If we wanted to list all of Madison Cawthorn's scandals since he declared his candidacy, we'd probably need, like, you know, wacko, a pointer, an easel, and a jaunty tune in the public domain. But suffice to say, <laughs> they have been more or less constant, right? Like, during his campaign, 160 of his former classmates at Patrick and Henry Community College signed a letter accusing him of, quote, gross misconduct towards our female peers, public misrepresentation of his past, disorderly conduct that was against the school's student honor code, end quote. And, and that he, quote, established a reputation of predatory behavior, end quote. Uh, this was on top of the Instagram post where he bragged about scratching visiting Hitler's vacation home off his bucket list. Uh, sorry, he, he bragged about visiting the Fuhrer's vacation home in case it wasn't already offensive enough. Yikes. Yeah, he said that, Fuhrer? No, that, those were his fucking words. Yeah, his highness. And that was, again, before the good people of North Carolina elected him to represent them in the halls of Congress. This represents the height of his political viability. Yeah, Madison Cawthorn is what happens when Denzel Washington isn't there to, like, tap his watch and then spy karate white assholes to death. We need more Denzel Washington's <laughs> spy karate assholes to death. I've said this. Yep. Now, of course, since joining Congress as its youngest member, his scandals have continued at a pretty impressive pace. Uh, he has scandals of the type that bother right-thinking people, like insider trading, siding with Vladimir Putin in the war on Ukraine, and repeatedly getting caught driving on a suspended license, as well as scandals of the type that bother right-wing people, like an inappropriate relationship with a male aide and pictures surfacing of him dressed in women's underwear. Now, to be super clear, it's pretty much impossible to care less about what Madison Cawthorn wears in his free time than I already do, but I have to bring up the lingerie photos because they're way more likely to cost him re-election than, you know, some petty felony like sexual misconduct or insider trading. Honestly, if it was Ava Braun's lingerie, he'd probably be fine with the voting. Yeah, list. right. Just a normal yeah. history buff, <laughs> checking out some clothes. I, I do like that, the, like... The stuff that people get mad about him for is the opposite on either sides of the political aisle. So the right is like, oh, did you hear about the cocaine orgy? And we're like, yeah, man, cocaine's delicious. Look at his signature. <laughs> yes. his, he spells his name wrong. So, yeah, as slow as they were to wake up to it, even his own party seems to be realizing that he's a bit of a liability. Republican political action committees have been absolutely dumping money into ad campaigns accusing Cawthorn of being a fame-seeking liar uh, because there's nothing the party of Donald Trump hates more than a fame-seeking liar, apparently. Um, of course, having the GOP establishment turned against him is at least potentially a net benefit for his political fortunes in the post-Trump era. But according to the New York Times, he's also starting to lose support from the far-right anti-establishment wing of the party. Now, for his part, Cawthorn has at least given up on blaming Democrats for the fact that Republicans keep pointing out what a jackass he is. He defended himself last week on Twitter saying, quote, I want to change the GOP for the better, and I believe in America first. I can understand the establishment attacking those beliefs, but just digging stuff up from my early 20s to smear me is pathetic, end quote. Um, and by the way, as weak a defense as that sounds, it gets all the weaker when you consider that the dude is 26. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. His early 20s were like the year before last. Uh, Just bu 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 Noah, I think a year and a half is plenty of time for someone who, let's say, had jokes that don't hold up super well on a podcast <laughs> to put that behind them. Why do you hate freedom? No illusions. Why do you hate freedom? Elon Musk buys our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I just want to add, it's extra sad because he looks really good in the lingerie. He does. He does. Yeah. If Cawthorn and his entire shitty voting base weren't giant bigots, it's just a nice little ad for a, a sexy Chardonnay in a magazine. End of story. Yeah. 
Now, his primary opponents are pointing out that given the pace of his unfolding scandals, he's likely to be implicated in the sinking of the main and the death of Bambi's mom by the time we get to the general election. And while his supporters scoff at the idea that any amount of scandal would cost Republicans his deep red district in the midterms, I feel like they might want to ask Roy Moore how that's worked out in the past. (laughs) Um, And and look, I'll freely admit that no amount of financial crimes, moving violations, or efforts to bring guns into places you aren't allowed to bring guns is going to cost him so much as a single fucking vote and Western North Carolina, but a video of a male aide and housemate placing his hand over Madison's crotch while alluding to how naked he wishes the congressman was, sure the fuck will, and that video exists. You'll find it in the ethics complaint about him giving that same aide a loan in violation of House rules. Okay, I give it a week before we get a video of Cawthorn getting pegged by Becky Falwell. Like, that's about to happen. <laughs> Jerry yeah. just watching from the corner. We're going to see yep. that video. Yep. Yeah. Which, again, is fine by us. Sure, yeah. That's great. Uh, honestly. enjoy that, if everybody loves that, I, do I, it. I'm starting to get confused. Enough scandals like this, and he might come back around to our side. <laughs> so- <laughs> So yeah, as sad as it is, the fact that he aided in an effort to overthrow the elected government probably won't cost him his job, and the fact that he was a well-known sexual predator and a Nazi sympathizer already didn't cost him his job. Hell, the fact that he's clearly engaged in a sexual relationship with one of his aides is a blatant violation of House rules. That wouldn't do it either, but the fact that said relationship involves an even number of penises just might do the trick. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Even penis numbers. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Dylan Gags, Order Border, F.A. Johnson, Mary Wynn Kling, Kevin R. Breen, person number 42, Walter Haynes, Robert Muse, Brian Garceau, Nicole Gilcrease, Jackson, Love That Dan Housen, Tressa Breen, Buoyant Citrus, Rebecca Margali, Kirk, Isbrand Dilemma, Eric Younga, Tanner, Johnny, Amy Tazenda, Alex Martinez, Chukwameka Arazor, Sam Hunter, and Marige Boudouin whose beautiful dicks and vaginas could be used as collateral to secure $44 billion in financing, (laughs) if need be. We're open to it. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Drafts on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Drafts on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Just do the comedy podcast, man. Okay. Do a voice. Hey. <laughs> Noah exasperatedly explains that things are almost incomparably better now than they've ever been at any point in history, and that this kind of ch- unchecked recency bias is the same thing that has boomers stuck in the endless cycle of destructive paranoia known as the good old days, but I'll do it after the ad so as not to fuck up the joke. Okay, but you didn't actually do it, though. <laughs> Eli does a backflip. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did do it. Though. It's a tie. I, uh... He says a joke and Eli laughs. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Put peanut butter in my sandwich. <laughs> the preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.